Um, We're continuing in our sermon series in the Gospel of John called Signs of the Messiah. And this is not a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse treatment of John. Instead, this study is focused specifically on looking at the seven signs that John lays out in his Gospel um, and how they point to Jesus' identity. And specifically, John tells us at the end of his Gospel that they are all for the purpose of encouraging faith in him as the giver of eternal life. As it says in John 20, 31, but these are written, that is, these specific signs are written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. John shows time and again in the Gospel of John that, that Jesus is the giver of life. And that these signs are one way that we can see him as the Messiah, as God's promised, anointed king, the Savior, the Lord, who gives that life. And we're going to talk today about um, the third of these signs, which, again, I want to remind you that signs are not necessarily equal to miracles. Sometimes signs contain miracles, Today we're going to talk about a sign where a miracle happens, but it happens off screen. So thus far, we've had Jesus turning water into wine, which we don't actually really see the miracle. It just reported that it happened. Um, And the second sign is Jesus clearing the temple and then stating, if you need a sign of my authority, destroy this temple, meaning his body, and I will raise it uh, back up in three days which is actually pointing forward to his resurrection. So, so far the two signs haven't been like this, wow, here is this miracle right in front of us. The first one's done in secret, and the second one, no miracle at all actually takes place. And today we're going to see a miracle does place, take place, but it is off screen. It is not on the pages. And there is, again, a reason for that. And it goes very clearly with John's purpose here and how the Holy Spirit wants to work in our lives. So we are going to pray, and we're going to dive into God's Word for us today. Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you that you speak to us, that you draw us to yourself in faith. And Lord, sometimes you use miracles and signs and things like that to do it, and other times we just hear and believe. And Lord, help us to be the kind of people that believe you and take you at your word. Open your word to us today, Lord Jesus. May your spirit speak to us. We ask this in Christ's name. So, beginning in chapter 4, verses 43 through 45, it says, after the two days he left for Galilee, and I'll give you the, the context of what these two days are referring to in a moment, Now Jesus himself had pointed out that a prophet has no honor in his own country. When he arrived in Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. They had seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, for they also had been there. So Jesus um, is going home at this point in time. He's traveling back to Galilee from Judea. He was in Jerusalem for the Passover festival. He had been doing some ministry in the Judean countryside after that. And now he is going back to Galilee and he's going through the region of Samaria. And actually chapter 4, verses 1 through 42, talk about that. So the last time, just to give you kind of a quick, wait, wait, weren't we in chapter 2 like last week? Yes. Chapter 2 is Jesus clearing the temple, uh, the water and the wine, Jesus clearing the temple. Chapter 3 is Jesus' interaction with Nicodemus, you must be born again, that whole scene. And then after that, it is an interaction where he's in the Judean countryside and interacting um, with John the Baptist a bit. And actually, John the Baptist basically saying, I need to step off the scene so Jesus, this is really about Jesus. Chapter 4 begins with Jesus and his disciples traveling through the region of Samaria and talking to, um, the, the main scene is Jesus talking to the Samaritan woman at the well. At the end of that scene, you might recall, um, he reveals very clearly to the woman that he is the Messiah. I kind of mentioned this last week. Jesus 
doesn't often do that. He, uh, it says at the end of chapter 2 that he doesn't entrust himself to people because he knows what's in their heart. And yet in Samaria, these people that are, he would call them less orthodox in their beliefs. Um, they, they didn't believe a big chunk of the Old Testament. Um, and yet they believed in Messiah, which is actually developed much more in, in uh, the prophets a lot, but they didn't actually believe in the prophets. Um, they didn't accept the prophets. They accepted the law, um, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That's kind of all they accepted. Some early history like Joshua and whatnot, but after a while they were like, yeah, we don't think the rest of that's inspired. And so Jesus comes and he shares with this woman who he is, who she is for that matter, and this woman goes back to her village, if you recall, and tells everybody, I've met, I've met a man who's told me everything I've ever done. Surely is a prophet of God. Um, even after he said very clearly, I am the Messiah, they all come out, and it says many of the Samaritans there put their faith in Jesus. And this is important because it plays into what's about to happen. Jesus performed no miraculous things while he was in Samaria that are recorded here. He did no miracles, as far as we know. It says they believed him based off of what he said, off his words, not signs. And this is actually how John puts it. And this is the text that literally leads up to our text for today. And because of his words, many people believed just because of what you, uh, not, uh, uh, I'm sorry, many people, uh, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the savior of the world. You will notice there is a theme in the verbs in this, th these verses. It's because of the words of Jesus, not just even based off the words of the woman, but because they have heard for themselves and now believe. It is in, to that contrast that we come to verse 43 and the story of Jesus returning to Galilee. And actually is how we are to make sense of everything that is about to happen. So Jesus goes to Galilee and we're told that he's welcomed there. And then there is this very strange side note it says, Jesus had earlier stated that a prophet is not welcomed or is without honor in his home country. He warns of a prophet's acceptance or lack thereof in his home country. Now, what's interesting is if you've read through, if you started reading through John chapter 1 and you got to this verse in John chapter 4, you'd say, Jesus hasn't said this. And yet John here says, like he said earlier, as if to assume that you all know that. I want to make a quick comment on why that is. In fact, how many of you have your Bibles open right now will notice that that comment is in parentheses? Okay. Now, you, um, you might ask, were there parentheses in ancient Greek? And the answer is, sort of. There actually is a way to set off something as kind of a side note. And that happens in very early manuscripts in this text. What is going on here is it is, is pretty universally accepted. John wrote his gospel at the end of the first century, after Matthew, Mark, and Luke had already been written. Mark, for sure, was widely circulated. And the comments that Jesus make about not being welcome, the prophet being without honor in his hometown or his home country, are found in Mark, meaning that John is assuming his audience knows this story already. The story, Jesus saying that. This isn't the only time that happens. Later on, when uh, Jesus goes to raise Lazarus, says, now Mary, that's the one that Jesus drove the demons out of. You remember her? Not told in John. But he says it like you, of course, know that story. He is assuming prior knowledge of other Gospels, at least Mark. Um, and we don't, he doesn't say that explicitly, so we don't know, but at least Mark if not Matthew and Luke as well. That is not to say he had them opened up in front of him when he was writing this, but he's like, you have all heard this story, which goes into actually the reason why John wrote his gospel. John said, I'm writing this, in a sense, 
to fill in gaps of stories you don't know and to point out and bring forth signs that point to who Jesus is. And early church historians, very early, very early, like within 20 years of the Gospel of John being written, were saying he wrote that to kind of fill in the gaps that Matthew, Mark, and Luke had left. So he assumed that you knew Matthew, Mark, and Luke, or at least one of them. And if you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they're called synoptic, meaning same view, because they cover a lot of the same material. All right, it's a side note, because it's a side note in the text, but it's important, because I want you to make sure that when you're reading Scripture, you're like, I don't understand why he says this here. Now, you might say, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember reading that somewhere, but you read it in a different gospel. Just keep that in mind. At this point in time, his reputation, if you recall, in chapter 2, when he's in Jerusalem and he flips over the tables, I said very few people even knew who he was. By this point in time, his reputation had grown, mostly due to the signs he had performed in Jerusalem, and we're told that many of the Galileans were there and had witnessed them. And so we're told that he's being welcomed, and yet John kind of does a little foreshadowing here and says, but remember, prophets are without honor in their home country. So this welcome is not, they're not cheering for him as the Messiah. They're looking at him as a wonder worker, as a miracle worker. And you might say, well, isn't that the same thing? No, no. In fact, you'll hear people say, I think he might be a prophet. Or they'll say, oh, I, you know, other people perform miracles on occasion. Performing a miracle in and of itself doesn't prove that you're God. It's the words that you say along with it that point out those truths. So once more, we're told he visited Cana in Galilee, where he had turned, water into, um, turned the water into wine. And there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. When this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son, who was close to death. Unless... You people see signs and wonders, Jesus told him. You will never believe. And yes, you should notice the term, you people. This is not said, unless you people see signs and wonders, you won't believe, so I'll show you some signs and wonders. He's saying it disparagingly. He's saying it in a negative way. The royal official said, sir, come down before my child dies. Go, Jesus replied, your son will live. And this is the key to this entire sign. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. So Jesus returns to Cana, the site of his first sign, turning water into wine. He's back where he started, in a sense. And he is approached by a royal official, um, we don't know a ton about this guy. Um, this is someone who probably worked for Herod Antipas. Uh, literally, the term used to describe him is uh, a, a, a king guy, meaning someone who works for the king. It's a, a, a royal. Uh, and the king here, you'd be like, aren't they in like Rome? Wouldn't the king be the emperor? Nope. It's actually a reference to a, a local king. And Herod was considered by most people to be the king but a king is under an emperor. By the way, this is just a, a, a quick historical note. If you don't know the difference between an emperor and a king, here's the short version. Emperors have kings under them. They're the king of all the kings in that region. They might have local kings that rule over regions, but they are in charge of everything. That's what an emperor is. So an emperor isn't just a really great king. He is literally, and this is the expression used in the ancient world, he is the king of kings. That's... So when, when the scripture describes Jesus as king of kings and lord of lords, it means the one that is above them all. That's what that expression means. So this guy, he's a royal, royal official, which is just an interesting note because it doesn't play anything into the rest of the story. He's not coming on official business. He's coming out of a deeply personal concern. His son is dying. And he's heard about Jesus. And so out of utter desperation and love for his kid, he travels to find Jesus. Oops, sorry, our clicker's working a little odd today. The official has actually traveled over 16 miles 
from Capernaum seeking out Jesus. That is about a day's journey on foot, which actually makes perfect sense in the context of the story because this interaction, we have in every sign that Jesus performs, by the way, um, John likes to throw in little details, and a lot of them have to do with numbers. If you haven't noticed this yet, in the first sign, the number is the number of gallons of water he turned into wine. In the second sign, it was the number of years it took them to rebuild or to build the temple and how Jesus would be able to do it in three days. And in this time, it is the time of day that the miracle took place. One o'clock in the afternoon. Why is that important? It'll come up in the second part of the verse here, the second part of the story. So he, he travels about a day to come and find Jesus. And you might say, well, I mean, I guess if my son was sick and dying, I might, I heard if there's a guy who might be able to heal him, I would take the chance too. Right? We might. I'll be honest, if it was me, I might not have done that. I might want to be by my son just in case he's not alive when I get back. But this guy's like, I've got to do what I can do. He's desperate. There is no indication that the official sees Jesus at this point in time as anything other than a miracle worker. There's no sense that he's saying like, listen, I have this great faith in you as, as Messiah or something like that. He's just like, I heard you can do stuff. I heard, I heard about what you did in, in, Gal, in uh, Judea. Can you, like, can you come with me and heal my son? He doesn't know. His son is dying and he's, his need is desperate, so he goes. And he doesn't just ask Jesus. The way this is worded, he begs Jesus. And Jesus' words, you'll notice here, when he says, you people need signs and wonders. Actually, the only time that expression is used in, in John. It's not just to the official, but it's to the Galileans at large, which kind of indicates a couple of things. His, his words here are... This interaction is not a private interaction. Jesus was probably teaching, or at least in a public setting, and this guy comes up to him and says, you're, you're the Jesus guy everybody's talking about, right? Okay, hey, my son is dying in Capernaum. I need you to come with me right now. And Jesus says, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will never believe. And I said this earlier, but this is not said in a kind tone. This is said in a disparaging way. He's saying this like, why do you guys need this? Now, if you recall, the last time that Jesus was in Galilee, Jesus hadn't performed any public signs. None. No miracles had been performed publicly. And nobody was crowding around to hear Jesus. He was traveling pretty freely, and suddenly he's done some signs down in Jerusalem and Judea, they've heard about it. Some of them have seen it, and now there's a crowd around him. And he says, it's interesting. You guys only seem to care what I have to say when I do stuff for you. That is what he's getting at here. You're only going to believe when I, when I do stuff for you, right? When I show you these signs? Okay. The need, they need signs to put their faith in him not just as a miracle worker, but as the Messiah, which is what his intent is. He's not coming to just say, listen, I'm a prophet from God, or I'm a miracle worker. He's saying, I am the promised Messiah. Again, I know every week I've said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote D.A. Carson at some point in time, and here we go. In John's gospel, too much interest in the raw miracles themselves is spiritually dangerous. Miracles cannot compel genuine faith. Hear that again. Miracles cannot compel genuine faith. But the apologetic value of miracles, though often exaggerated, should not be despised. Jesus himself can encourage faith on that basis, especially amongst those too skeptical to trust his word. To put it another way, seeing miracles is not going to cause you to believe in God. It's not going to cause you to believe in Jesus. I've, 
told this story before, but I, I've heard stories of where somebody witnesses a miracle and they immediately try to explain it away. Or they come to weird conclusions about how it happened. And sometimes the conclusions might still include God, but it's also like, well, this angel, this angel. And I'm like, it's not about an angel, it's about God. Or people talk about seeing signs in different ways, and they're like, I saw this sign. And I'm like, maybe you did. But the question we should always ask is, what did that sign do? Did that encourage you to put your faith in Jesus? To have a deeper faith in Jesus? If it didn't, I'm not saying it's not from God. I'm saying that's not what we're supposed to believe in. Jesus, I'm going to, those two verses that D.A. Carson references at the bottom, we're going to come back to. Um, he, he warns people, be careful about just believing because of things you see. Why? Because those things can be faked. The term signs and wonders, by the way, interestingly enough that Jesus uses that term, it's not an accident. The term signs and wonders appears throughout Scripture several places, but the place that it appears most frequently together is actually in the Exodus event. In the events leading up the, the ten plagues of Egypt, and it talks about how God allowed Moses to perform these signs and wonders as a, as a judgment against the gods of Egypt. And, and yet, Pharaoh just won't, tr- won't let him go, right? So the signs and wonders are not enough. It's not until it really hits close to home, and it's his own son that dies, that he relents. And even then, it's just for a short period of time. But there's an interesting note in the Exodus, event, uh, Exodus account. It says when they first start performing signs and wonders, some of the magicians of the Pharaoh can do the same things. When they turn water into uh, the, the blood of, of the Nile into, uh, or the water of the Nile into blood, they're like, yeah, we can do that too, look. And it might have been a trick, it probably was a trick. But that's the point. Signs and wonders in and of themselves aren't enough. How many, how many of you have ever seen the movie The Prince of Egypt? I should have pulled this clip from that movie. There's a great scene in that when they first start, um, Moses and Aaron are bringing in, you know, doing signs, and the two magicians, by the way, who are voiced by Martin Short and Steve Martin, um, are, are like, oh, yeah, that's interesting. We can do that too. Oh, our staff can turn into a snake as well. And then off screen you see Aaron's staff eat the other staff which is what happens in Scripture. But there's, I, I love that scene because it just, it, it's a very visual take on like, look, this wasn't enough. And Jesus says the same thing. He's like, unless you guys have this, it's like you're not going to believe. And despite the rebuke, Jesus still assures the man that his son has been healed. So you'd say the sign is that Jesus healed this man's son. We don't even see it. Jesus doesn't even go to the guy. He doesn't leave. He just says, go, your son's going to be fine. Now this story is often compared to the stories in the the synoptics about Jesus healing a uh, a centurion's son. Um, There's a lot of similarities. The centurion comes and says, my son is ill. I know you can heal him. And Jesus doesn't rebuke that guy at all. He says, I'm impressed by your faith. And then the guy says, Jesus is like, I'll come with you. And the guy says, I know you don't have to. I know you have the authority because I'm, I'm, I'm in a position of authority. If I tell my men to do something, it's done. I know if you just say the word, my son will be healed. And Jesus is like, all right. And actually Luke tells the story and he goes, Jesus replied, I've not seen such faith in all of Israel. This guy is not Jewish. And he has this kind of faith in Jesus. And he's like, yes. He's not rebuking the guy for having faith. He's not rebuking the guy for asking for a miracle. He's rebuking this group of people because their faith only comes through the signs. This guy, that centurion already trusted Jesus. That's why he came. This guy, this royal official, he's he's grasping at straws. 
But then when Jesus makes this comment and then says to the guy, go home, your son's going to be okay, something changes. And this, like I said, is the key to the entire, this entire passage. It says, the official took Jesus at his word. He took Jesus at his word. He said, okay. He said, he's healed. All right. And he goes home. In fact, there's a small detail in this story that until you get to the next section, you might miss. The guy trusted Jesus so much that he didn't go right home. It's the next day, and he's traveling on the road, and he's told, yesterday at 1 o'clock, that's when your son got better. Which means the guy spent the night in Capernaum. Or, I'm sorry, in Cana, instead of going back to Capernaum that night. Now, if it was me, I would have been like, oh, I, I think, I, okay, I'm going to take him at his word. I would have been like, I'm going. I would just start walking home and walk through the night. But this guy's like, all right, I'm going to spend the night here. I'll go home in the morning. By the way, he's a royal official. If you're like, well, maybe you wouldn't travel at night because, you know, maybe you get jumped, you get, like, robbed. He's a royal official. He would have had guards with him. What we see is this guy has seen no evidential sign, but he, yet he trusts Jesus based solely on what Jesus just said. And yes, the sign, if you want to, one here is that Jesus healed this, this boy from a distance. But that is not actually what John brings out. He actually brings out the necessity for trusting Jesus, not based on signs that we see, but on what we have heard. This is exactly what happened to the Samaritans. They didn't need signs. They believed when they heard what Jesus said. Later on, actually, right before, I keep every, every week I keep coming back to John 20, 31. Yet these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and by believing you might have life in his name. The verse before that, it says, Jesus did many other miraculous signs in his disciples' presence. These have been written that you might believe. Okay? The verse right before that is this. This is Jesus speaking to Thomas. Do you remember Thomas? We call him Doubting Thomas. Poor Thomas. Poor Thomas. The rest of the disciples see Jesus risen and he doesn't. And they're like, we saw him alive and he said, listen, I mean, I want to believe that, but unless I can actually see the wounds, touch him myself, I won't believe. And then shortly after that, Jesus shows up. And he says to Thomas, I get it. Look. Look at the, hand, the holes in my hands, my side, and my feet. Go ahead, put your finger here. Does Thomas come up and touch Jesus? He does not. He drops to his knees on the spot and says, my Lord and my God. And then Jesus says, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And it is right after that that John then says, now these signs, Jesus did all kinds of signs, but these were written down so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus keeps saying, and John keeps pointing out, we, I get it, sometimes you need that sign. But the sign ain't going to save you. The miracle is not what you need. It's the miracle worker. It's not the sign, it's who the sign points to that you need to believe. And that is what the point that Jesus is making here is. Think about it. If Jesus really wanted to, remember what John says at the beginning of this? 
He said, remember, Jesus said a prophet is without honor in his home country. If Jesus just wanted to bring honor to himself and say, look at me, he could have been like, hey, crowd, we're going on a road trip. Let's go see this guy's son, and I'm going to go heal him or bring him back from the dead. He doesn't do that. He said, go home, your son is fine. You got to expect that some people in the crowd are like, man, I thought we were going to see something. I thought we were going to see something cool. Not being like, did he just heal a guy from like 16 miles away? A kid from 16 miles away just by saying it? There is no guarantee that that sign would have produced faith. And yet for at least a couple people it did. While he, this is the official, was still on the way, his servants met him with the news that his boy was living. When he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said to him, yesterday, at one in the afternoon, the fever left him. Then the father realized that this was the exact time at which Jesus had said, your son will live. Now again, I pointed this out, but if it's one o'clock in the afternoon, and it's a 16-mile trek, and, you're, and even if you're going at a slow pace, that's, that's about, we'll say, eight hours of walking. Now, granted, if he just walked eight hours to get there, he might be exhausted, but it's one o'clock in the afternoon when he meets Jesus, which means he might have already been there for a little bit. And he doesn't turn around and just start heading back immediately. The, in, the implication here is he waited till the next morning. He might have set off early, but he waited till the next morning because it happened yesterday at one o'clock. And you might be like, well, maybe it's after midnight. Jewish days start at sundown. That wouldn't matter. And they wouldn't have said yesterday if they meant like, oh, I meant yesterday. It's like it's, it's 7 o'clock now and the sun went down, so I meant yesterday. They're not doing that. They're not, that's not what's going on here. What happened? So he and his whole household believed. This was the second sign Jesus performed after coming from Judea to Galilee. As the official travels home, he is informed of his son's restoration at the very moment that Jesus declared it to be so. He took Jesus at his word. He didn't see Jesus lay his hands on this kid or anything. And this actually leads the man and his whole household to put their faith in him. By the way, the word household there doesn't just mean his wife and his kids. It means he's a royal official. He has a big household. He has all these servants. He has all of these people. And they all heard this and they said, and, and by the way, when, when, when Scripture says put their faith in him, that does not mean like they believe that Jesus could perform miracles. It means saving faith. They trusted that Jesus was exactly who he claimed to be. And then we're told, John points out that this was the second Galilean sign that he performed. The English translation of this is a little tricky because it says um, this is the second sign he performed from the time he, re- he came to Ju- uh, Galilee from Judea. And technically he went to get Judea in between the two signs, so it sounds a little odd. The way that it's worded, though, it actually means it's the second thing he did, not in Judea, but in Galilee. It's really hard to kind of keep that sense and translate it. So, so John is, is kind of pointing out something here. He's saying this is the second sign that Jesus performed in Galilee, and where does it happen? Where the first one did, in Cana. It's kind of a little full circle. But the first one was very private. The second one is semi-public. I mean, he pronounces it publicly, but nobody sees anything happen. Jesus points out the need for signs as a lack of faith. I want you to think about that. He points out the fact that To need a sign to trust is actually a lack of faith. 
Yet, he repeatedly says that signs can lead us to faith. John 10, 38, he says this, yet repeatedly, uh, uh, sorry, but if I do them, that is these works, these signs, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. He's saying like, listen, I, I know you're not trusting the words that I'm saying to you, but at least look at the signs, the works that I'm doing. If that doesn't show you, partnered with my words, you know, hopefully that'll, that'll lead you to a sense of faith. The signs on, the mo- on their own won't do it. We need those words. And yet, he says, it would be better if you could just trust me based on what I said. Again, in John 14, um, 11. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. There he's saying it to his disciples. Just the inner group. Part of the farewell discourse. He's not saying that signs are bad. He's just saying, listen, it would be better if you just believed me. But if you need a sign, here's the sign. Here, there's, look at the things I've been doing. Now, you might say, well, why would John make such a point of this? Why would the Holy Spirit lead John to do this? How often in our lives do we get signs? I don't know about you. I mean, I've had a handful of times in my life that I'm like, Lord, I just need, I need you to show me that you're going to show up here. And God sometimes will do something. And it might be that he was going to do it whether I asked him to or not because that's what God does. But a lot of times, it's about trusting him and taking him in his word. He doesn't always give us something miraculous or something big. And what happens when we're in that moment when we need to trust him and we say, I'm only going to do it if you give me some kind of sign? Imagine if your kids said that to you. Mom, Dad, I, I'll trust you, but only if you, if you do the following thing for me. Only if you sh- prove your love for me in some way right now. Wouldn't that be kind of hurtful? You're like, I think I prove my love for you every day. You're breathing and you're eating. There's a roof over your head. I did not drop you off on the side of the road the other day when I, when I really wanted to. I must love you. Right? And then for us to turn around and say, yeah, but show me. I shouldn't have to show you. I show you all the time. That's what Jesus is getting at. It's not that on occasion needing a sign is, a, is bad, but he says that we're to focus on taking Jesus at his word. Recently I was reading through the, the book of Daniel with my boys and we get to the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And I said to them, oh, guys, this is one of my favorite stories. And they're like, oh, yeah, because God like, saves them from the fiery furnace. I said, no, because of what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say before they're thrown in. If you know that story, they're about to get thrown into a furnace for not worshiping false, a false god. And they say to King Nebuchadnezzar, the most powerful man on earth, they say, listen, We know our God who we serve could save us. But even if he doesn't, we will not bow down. We know he can do something miraculous. We don't need him to do that for us to be obedient in this situation. We're going to be obedient no matter what. Because he deserves it no matter what. To me, that's the most powerful statement in that whole story. The focus here is taking Jesus at his word. And the goal is to trust Jesus as our Lord and Savior. I know we use that expression a lot as Christians, but just to break that down, Lord means that he's in charge. Savior means that he is the one that deals with our sin. If we need signs, he will use them. But signs cannot ensure faith. They can't. 
If signs could ensure faith, miracles would be happening on every corner every day. But of course, then they would lose their potency, right? Their, their effectiveness. Signs can ensure faith. Here's our so what. Are we taking Jesus at his word? That's the call here. Trusting him to be who he claims to be. Maybe for us, maybe we know Jesus already as Lord and Savior. Maybe for us that's saying, you say you will provide. I'm going to trust you to provide. I'm going to take you at your word that you're the provider. I don't know how I'm going to pay the rent. I don't know how I'm going to put food on the table. But you said you would take care of me, so I'm going to trust you to do it. I'm going to give that to you. And if we don't know Jesus, it's taking him at his word that he is the one that needs to be in charge, that he is the one that wants to deal with our sins. This is our meditation verse for this week, John 20, 29. I'm going to ask um, Dick to come up and lead us in a time of prayer. Then Jesus told them, because you have told him, because you have seen me, you have believed, but blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed.